for the rest of you, here's what I'm going to ask you to do. I'm going to ask you to take your Bible. I'm going to ask you to turn to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12. Put one finger there. And then turn to Psalm 90. And put a finger there. And when you have both established, would you please stand to read the Word of God. Luke 12 and Psalm 90. Luke 12 we'll read at verse 15. Psalm 90 we'll read at verse 10. Oh, guess what? I have to turn there too, huh? Luke chapter 12, verse 15. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do, because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. Psalm 90, verse 10. The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, yet is their strength, labor, and sorrow. For it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Who knoweth the power of thine anger? Even according to thy, to thy fear, so is thy wrath. So teach us to number our days, that we may supply our hearts unto wisdom. Father, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, I ask you, Master, that you will anoint the preaching of your word. I ask, Lord, that you will open up the minds and understanding and soften the hearts, uh, Lord, of those who listen. I pray, God, that this message would go forth with the power of your spirit. Lord, that it will meet its mark and that it will do its work. And, God, I pray that in everything that is said now, here, that your name will be glorified, that your will will be done. And this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. The title of my message this morning, Drop Dead Time. (laughs) Drop Dead Time. Is anybody familiar with the term Drop Dead Time? Some of you don't. I asked people all week. I was asking people what, and and no one I talked to actually knew what it was. Can I tell you a story for a moment? Years ago, I was a operations manager with Federal Express and then FedEx. I ran the night ops in East Hartford, and then I ran the night ops in Norwalk. And uh, one of my responsibilities, one of the chief responsibilities, was to get the trucks out to the airport on time. So have you ever seen the pickup, the couriers are out there in their little vans, they're driving around like crazy, they're collecting all the freight, they're picking up all the packages, and then they all come to the, to the station where the freight comes down the conveyor belt, and we, we do a quick sort, we load it up in containers, we put it on the trucks, and the trucks head off to the airport. They have to get to the airport on time. There is a window available for each truck, it's scheduled. And, and within minutes, each truck arrives and it has, to, it has to offload in time so that it can get onto the airplanes and fly out to Memphis. And if you've ever been to Memphis during the sort, uh, Memphis International Airport shuts down except for FedEx planes. And they come in two minutes apart. You look in the sky and you see them stacked up all over, coming in two minutes apart. If one, con- uh, conceivably, if one of our trucks leaves the station to, and to gets to the airport out of sequence, it can throw off the entire operation and all the planes coming from all over the world can literally be thrown into a tizzy because one truck was late to the airport. Conceivably. You understand. You get the picture here. 
There's a certain window. And so I knew that my responsibility was to get the trucks out on time. Now, let's just say one of the trucks had to leave at 8.30 from Norwalk to get to the Newark airport to, to make the, the sort in order for the planes to leave on time. I know that 8.30 that truck has to leave. But I also know, being an ops manager, that if the, train, if the truck left at 8.35, and there was no traffic and uh, no, the weather cooperated. My driver was on, you know, on, on top of things. He could get to the airport in time. I also knew as an ops manager that if the truck left at 840, there was probably a pretty good chance that the truck would still make, make it on time. There's a little wiggle room in there. But I also knew that at 845, if the truck left at 845 and not a second later, and the traffic was reasonable, and the weather permitted, and the driver was on top of his game or her game, I knew that if the truck left at 8.45, not a second later, there was a good chance that truck could squeeze in and just make it on time. And so 8.45 was drop dead time. If the freight was coming down the belt at 8.45 and, and, and the, the truck wasn't ready to leave, the door was closed and the truck was leaving and everything else just was what it was. We had to deal with that. But 8.45 was drop dead time. Not a second later, there was a window of opportunity and the window closed at drop dead time. The window, friends, of opportunity is called life. We have a window of opportunity. Life is short. The days of our years, the psalmist said, I believe it was Moses in, in Psalm 90. The days of our years are 70 to 80 years on average. 70 to 80 years. That's not a promise like the faith teachers teach. Faith teachers will say, well, God has promised us 70 to 80 years, and so if anybody is sick and they die before that, it's because they had some secret sin that was unconfessed. They didn't have faith. That, that's nonsense. Psalm uh, 90, when it says our, our lives, the, 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 the years of our lives are 70 to 80 years, it's a statement of limitation. God is saying, I have limited your lifespan on average to 70 or 80 years. And here's why. Understand this. God had shortened man's life. Now, we've increased it somewhat with medical science, but medical science is still within the realms and will of God. And so don't, don't misunderstand this. But God has shortened the lifespan. How many know who Methuselah is or was? Methuselah, son of Enoch. Genesis chapter 5, the Bible says that Methuselah lived to be 969 years old. People lived long back then, 400, 500, 600, 800, 969 years, Methuselah, Genesis chapter 5. Listen to what Job says, Job chapter 14 and verse 1, the Bible says, Man that is born of a woman, that would be most, is of few days and full of trouble. Job said, we're, we're born, and, and only a few days later, already trouble comes. And, and we know, friends, the longer we live, there's, the more trouble. Life is full of trouble. Come on. And so 969 years, there's a lot of trouble. The longer we live, the more trouble we get into, is what Job was saying. And so God shortened life. Listen, Genesis chapter 6 one chapter later in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 6, verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for that he also is flesh. Yet his days shall be an hundred and twenty years. From 969 in Genesis chapter 5 to 120 in Genesis chapter 6. God shortened the lifespan. And now in Psalm 90, he shortened it either, even further to the average of 70 or 80 years. You with me? Amen. James, in light of eternity, James, the, the uh, apostle, writes in James chapter 4, verse 14, Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. You don't know about tomorrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. What is your life? Your life, whether you live to be 70, 80, 90, 100 years, it's a, in, in, in light of eternity, it's a vapor, it's a mist, it's a poof. Comes, you come on the scene, you live, gone, right? 
in, in the light of eternity, life is but a vapor, a mist, a fog. It comes and it goes away. Life is so fast and so fleeting. But did you know we were created with the capability of living forever? We were, God created us in the garden to live forever. We, we were created with the ability, the capability, I should say, of living forever. Our bodies, our, the cells in our bodies replace themselves. I know I was taught every seven years, but I did some research, and that's not true. Some of the cells replace themselves quicker than seven years, some of them later than seven years, and some cells never replace themselves at all, like brain cells, which explains a lot. <laughs> Just saying. And so we, we were created. We have antibodies within our bodies that attack uh, uh, intruders, uh, any disease or bacteria or infection that tries to attack us, we have antibodies to rise up and attack them. And you get the fever because your body's working. It, there's a battle going on. You got white blood cells that rush to the scene to, to heal and to, and, and to fix our needs. Um, there's a new series on uh, Animal Planet called The Monsters Within Me. You ever see that? Have you seen that? I saw a couple of clips on, on, uh, on the in computer, but... <laughs> You know, when, when we die, uh, corruption, most of corruption comes from within. All the bugs and parasites and bacteria inside of our body because we're no longer, it's no longer being resisted by the antibodies. What I'm trying to say is God has created us that we have the capability of living forever. But because of sin, Genesis 3, 19, from dust you came, from dust you shall return. You're going to die one day. And, uh, and, and, and our bodies are good because of sin. Corruption has come because of sin. You know, I hate to break this to you, but the mortality rate among human beings is a staggering 100%. <laughs> this life, this life that we live is not forever. No one gets out of here alive. And we have this presumption we presume as we go through this life, we have this presumption that we're just fine, that uh, we can handle everything, we're in control, and we seem to have this presumption that we've got lots of time. We've got all the time in the world to make our plans and to fix things out. Listen to what the Proverbs says. Proverbs 27, verse 1, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Don't boast. Don't say what you're going to do tomorrow and what tomorrow is going to be like because you have no idea. It's not given to you, first of all, and you don't know what tomorrow holds. Too often, we lay out our plans according to our wills and our desires. We say, this is what I want to do. This is my plan. This is what I want to do. This is my will. And we lay out our plan. We figure out what we want to do and how we're going to do it, where, when, with, uh, with whom. And, and then we say, hey, God, here's my plan. Bless it. Here's my plan, Lord. Come and help me. And, and, then, we, and then we get upset when things don't work out accordingly. And we even blame God and say, Lord, why didn't you help me? How come things are such a mess? Why did you let this happen? Or even accusing him of doing wrong and saying, Lord, why did you do this to me? I prayed. Why did this happen? How could you? And we blame God for, for the way our lives go because they didn't go according to our plan and the way we had foreseen. And we accuse God of doing something wrong. Listen, James says in chapter 4, verse 14, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Instead of saying, this is what I want to do, God, bless it. We should say, Lord, what do you want? What is your will for my life? What do you want me to do? Rather than make our own plans and, and ask God to help us do what we think we should do, how about we ask God what his plan is for us? See, we presume too much. We presume to have all the time in the world. We presume to have it all together. But none of us know the day or the hour we'll leave this world, do we? No one knows the day or the hour. You know, when we witness, we go out on, in the Daffodil Festival, or we go out on the street, or wherever we are, we, you know, we, we do, do the uh, uh, Way of the Master, or there are other 
ways to witness to people, to tell them about Jesus. But here's something that I hear very often. And tell me if you hear the same. Well, one day I'll get right with God. Right? You've heard it, right? One day. Not ready right now. One day I'll get right with God. That's a plan. And it's a good one. If you could tell me the day and the hour you're going to die. Because then here you could do whatever you want. You could uh, plot your own course. You don't even have to consult God. Don't even have to worry about what he wants. Just do what you want to do. Live your life according to your plan. And the moment before you know you're going to die, just repent. And ask God to forgive you. Get right with God then and, uh, and you'll be okay. See, the only problem with that is you don't know the day or the hour you're going to die. In fact, death most often comes suddenly. Uh, sometimes it sneaks up on us through illness and we're prepared for it. But most often, an accident, um, heart attack, stroke, so forth. I don't mean to sound morbid, but... The truth remains, friends, that nobody knows the day or the hour that we will, in fact, drop dead. Right? In the middle of life comes death. We presume too much when we say how we're going to live and what we're going to do and how we're going to handle things. And uh, we presume too much when we think that we have all the time in the world. We're given a responsibility. With life comes responsibility. Still there? Amen. Make sure the person next to you is awake. The responsibility. With responsibility, uh, with life comes responsibility. We make a big mistake when we take on the attitude of the bumper sticker that says, whoever dies with the most toys wins. Right? We, we, we make a big mistake. I can't tell you how many times I have seen, I've counseled people uh, at funerals. I, I can't tell you how many times I've seen people who amass great wealth, successful in, in, in earth's terms, and, and then only to see the money squandered by their heirs. I had a friend who just recently passed away, but his, his in-laws, the they were in the car business, they owned a Cadillac uh, dealership years ago and the family was fabulously well to do and my friend told me about his in-laws how if you walked into the house while the while the parents were still very much alive and well but if you walked into the house and you picked up you could pick up anything and there was a name tag on the bottom of everything the furniture name tags on the bottom of it name tags on the bottom of everything every the siblings the, the children the offspring had everything labeled. Everybody had a claim to mom and dad's stuff. While they were still very much alive, they were just waiting for their demise so they could collect their stuff. And the, the, the parents died, and, uh, I don't know how far apart, but the family went in like vultures and everybody took their stuff and squandered it all. And all, all that they had amassed was gone. Jesus says the same thing of this man who says, I know what I'll do. I'll amass great wealth. And when I, get, when I don't have enough room for all of it, I'll just build bigger rooms and I'll just gather it all up. And Jesus says, you're, fool, you're a fool. Because when you're gone, who's going to benefit from all the hard work that you have done? Friends, it happens far too often. Listen, what I'm trying to say is this. There's nothing wrong with money. It's neutral. Money is neutral. Money is necessary. Money is good when you need it and you have it. It's a bad thing when you need it and you don't have it. Money itself is neutral. There's nothing wrong with money. Paul told Timothy, he said, the love of money is the root of all evil. We, we misquote this sometimes when we say love is, a, is the root of all evil. No, the love of money is, uh, money is not the root of all evil. It's the love of money. It's the, the, I have to have it. I have to have more. I've got to possess it. I want, I want more stuff. I want bigger stuff, better stuff. But listen to me, friends. Wealth should never be the concern. Wealth is not the responsibility of life. Are you with me? God has given us responsibility with this life. And the responsibility of life is not to amass great wealth. That's not the responsibility God has given us. 
No, that, that's not it at all. Listen, Jesus said, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things. What things? Basic necessities. All that you have need of will be provided for you. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. Matthew 6, 33. In other words, Jesus is saying, draw near to God and seek to do his will and follow after him in obedience and he's going to take care of the rest. Are you with me? Amen. Seek. For, what is the responsibility of our window of opportunity called life? To seek first God's righteousness, his kingdom, his righteousness, and, and, and follow him in obedience, and he will take care of everything else. So I ask you this morning, why are you so stressed? Why are you complaining that everything is not turning out? Let me ask you a better question. Why aren't things turning out for you? Why is there so much stress in your life over where you are and how you are? Why is that? Listen, he said that he will take care of the rest if we seek him first. His kingdom, his righteousness, he will take care of all of those things. So if we're worried and, 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 we, and it's not all coming together, could it, could it possibly be because you fill in the gap yourself, you're not stupid? Could it be that you have not sought him first? People are so st stressed trying to get more, trying to gain more, trying to have more. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 6, the Bible says, Better a handful with quietness then both hands fold together with toil and grasping for the wind. Better to have one handful, I got, I, got, I got enough. I got one handful, I got enough. It's enough for me, it's enough for my family. And have peace of mind, quietness of spirit. I'm okay. I got what I need, I'm all right. Better that than to have two hands full trying to hold it all together while you're chasing after more. Amen. Saith the baby. We should be more concerned with laying up treasure in heaven. Paul the Apostle, writing to the church of Corinth, in, in, in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, he talks of the works of the flesh. Works of the flesh are the things that we do for our own aggrandizement, our own pleasure, our own satisfaction, our own flesh, our own will, our own desire, our own plan. The things that we do for we. And, and, and the Bible says that they are wood, hay, and stubble. What do you know about wood, hay, and stubble? They're combustible. I heat my house with some of those things. And so what Paul is saying is when we live our lives to amass our own things, our lives are spent with our window of opportunity, we're living our lives for us. We're trying to do what we want. We're trying to gain our own pleasures and our own interests and our own happiness. And that's the focus of our lives. And, and this is what we bring before God. When we stand before him, the fire of his judgment will consume all those things and there's nothing left. All the things that we put our life to will be gone in an instant because they're only wood, hay, and stubble. But he says the things that we do for God's kingdom... The things that we do as we seek first the kingdom of God in his righteousness, the things that we do for God, for Christ, for his kingdom are gold and silver and precious stones. What do you know about gold and silver and precious stones? They'll endure the fire. Not only do they endure the fire, stones and precious stones are not hurt in the fire, but gold and silver are purified in the fire. It only gets better. So Paul is saying that we should be focused on laying up our treasures in heaven, doing those things for the kingdom. Listen, are you still with me? His kingdom, the Bible says, is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Ghost. Joy. Listen, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I want to tell you something. In this list, is not, there's nothing about happiness. Happiness, friends, when the Bible talks about happy is he or happy is she, happiness, it's talking about blessed. You, have, you are blessed of God. That's what happiness means in the Bible. But happiness is overrated. 
When you live your life to be happy, you're going to be thoroughly discouraged because happiness depends on happenings, and it doesn't always happen the way you want it to. And if you're living your life for happiness, you will live most of your life completely defeated. Happiness is overrated, but joy comes from the Lord. What is the kingdom of God? It's righteousness, it's peace, and it's joy in the Holy Ghost. Listen, righteousness. What is righteousness? It's doing what's right. When you are following God, when you're living for Christ, you're going to do what's right. How many know when you do what's wrong, it doesn't work out? And so when you're following God, when you're doing things His way, seeking His kingdom and His righteousness, you're going to do right things. It's going to work out a whole lot better for you. I promise you. I promise you. The kingdom of God is righteousness. It is peace. Look at Peace on earth. Goodwill toward men, the angel saying. He is the prince of peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. He's come to bring peace. Peace be, be with, with God. Peace with one another. The angel said, I bring you tidings of great joy. Joy, friends. Listen. Peace and joy cannot be found in this world of chaos. Amen. Happiness on occasion when everything happens. But peace and joy cannot be found in the world of chaos. All we have in the world is chaos. Peace and joy cannot be found there. Peace and joy can only truly be found in a personal relationship with God through his son Jesus Christ. Let me say it again, not for applause, but so that somebody might hear this. Peace and joy in this life only come through a personal relationship with Almighty God through His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The kingdom of God. We must seek first the kingdom of God. The mission of Christ. What Jesus came to do. Jesus came to establish God's kingdom on earth. That's what he said he came to do. In Luke chapter 4, verses 18 and 19, it says that he came to preach to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Jesus said he came to establish God's kingdom amongst us. He came to set the captive free to open the eyes of the spiritually blinded, to heal those that are sick, those that are bruised. How many are bruised, injured, hurt? He came to heal. He came to uplift. He came to set free. He came to save. Jesus came to do, the, to do that. And he's called us to do the same. Are you with me still? Hello. He's still there. He's called us to do the same. Our first responsibility in our window of opportunity called life, our first responsibility is to simply accept him. Why is that so hard? To simply accept what he has done for us. Contrary to popular church mentality, there is something required of us. It's called repentance. You won't hear that too much today. It's an outdated, old-fashioned word. I don't even know if the modern church knows the meaning. You won't hear it too much. But there is something required of us. It's to repent. Listen, in Acts chapter 3, 19, Peter says, Repent ye therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. The Bible says we have to repent. That means turn away from our lives of sin, our old lifestyle. Turn away from it. Done. Repent. And be converted. Don't just change religion. It means to be born of the Spirit of God, to be translated, to be, to, be, to be transformed when the times of refreshing come, when the Holy Spirit comes and He's here. The Spirit of God will convert us, will give us new birth, will, will, will wash away our sins, but we have to repent. We have to turn away from our sin and accept Christ. Our first responsibility is to accept Him. Jesus gives a parable of a quote-unquote successful man in the text that we read in Luke chapter 12. The man says, I will build bigger barns. I have so much. I'm doing so well. Just got a raise. Just got a promotion. Got some jing in my pocket. 
Things are looking good. I'll build bigger barns for my stuff. And Jesus said, God says to him, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. In other words, God is saying, that's what you think. That's what you think. That's the plan that you have made. That's how you see it. But you don't know the day or the hour. You don't know God's plan. See, friends, building bigger barns and amassing more wealth is not the responsibility of life. That's not what God has called us to do. It's not what he created us to do or called us to do. Our first responsibility is to accept Christ. Our next responsibility is to reach others. Jesus said, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night cometh when no man can work. Are you still with me? Amen. Sorry, I don't have a commercial to stick in here. To, i got to keep your attention for a couple minutes. I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. What did Jesus come to do? He came to seek and to save that which was lost. Set the captive free, open this side of the blind, heal the bruised and, and broken hearted. He said, I, this is, I've come to do to establish the kingdom of God in the hearts of men. And I only have a window of opportunity. While it is day, I must do the works of him who sent me. Because the night's coming. Drop dead time, as it were. The window is closing, and I won't be able to accomplish thereafter. And so I must do what I have to do now while it is day, while I have the window, while the window remains open. And he's called us to do the same thing. Friends, we have a certain window of opportunity. We don't know when that window will close. Some say we are living on borrowed time. I would, I would feel the same way. We're, we're living on borrowed time. But friends, I can tell you this. We are living on drop-dead time. Because the window is going to close. My third point. The response. We must redeem the time. Ephesians chapter 5, 15 and 16. Paul said, see then that you walk, <clears throat> excuse me, circumspectly. Not... <clears throat> Excuse me, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming, see that you walk circumspectly, see that you walk right, accordingly. Why? Because we have to redeem the time because the days are evil. That word redeem means to literally to ransom. It means to buy back the time, to rescue the time, to purchase back the time. Listen, we must make better use of our time. Psalm 90, verse 12, because our days are so few, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. It means to make an account of our days. Lord, teach us to make an account of our days. Te teach us to number our days. Literally, teach us to budget our days, to make every day count, to make every moment count. See, there's a certain amount of work that we are responsible for, and there's a certain number of days in which to accomplish that work. That, that's what we have. We, we have been given an assignment. We've been given a responsibility. Accept him and share him with others. That's the work to establish the kingdom of God in the hearts of people. A certain amount of work and only a certain amount of days to do it. It's a window of opportunity, and we don't know when the window closes. We need, we need to make an account of this. We must, therefore, make every day count. I'm, I'm almost done. The days are evil, Paul said. The temptations of our day are innumerable. You with me? Amen. The temptations of our day, friends, I don't know about you, but the temptations are innumerable, and, and they cover every spectrum of media. Everywhere you turn around, boom, 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 boom scrambling for our attention, voices and pictures and images and sounds and smells and everything else, uh, constantly trying to allure us in, trying to pull us in, uh, trying to, to, to allure us in, to, uh, all those things. There are so many activities that we were allured into which will steal our precious time, rob our time, time that should be invested in accomplishing the work of the kingdom is too often spent on the flesh, or worse. 
We must redeem the time. We have to redeem, ransom, buy back, make better use of the time. And so we'll close. We must live in the state of drop-dead time. Sorry it sounds so morbid, but the fact remains. None of us know the day and the hour we will, in fact, drop dead. And so we have to live our lives on the ready. We have to be ready for the window when it closes. We have to be ready. So how can we be ready? There's only one way, friends, to be ready, to confess our total faith in Jesus Christ to save us. We can't save ourselves. We can't make ourselves ready. We have to confess our total reliance upon the blood of Jesus Christ, our total faith in Jesus Christ alone for salvation. Amen. By repenting of our sinful life, turning away from our lives of sin, we must also be investing in the kingdom of God. You want to redeem the time? We have to be investing, making better use of our time, investing in the kingdom of God, doing the work of the one who has called us while it is day. For no one can do the works of him who sent us once drop dead time comes. We're living in drop dead time. Jesus is coming soon. If you have any sense of Bible prophecy, if you have any sense of the day in which we live, we can see, friends, very clearly the, the, the window is closing. We're approaching drop-dead time. And beside that, none of us know the hour when, in fact, our own lives will end. And so we must be ready. We must be redeeming the time. We must be making better use of the time. We're going to close with prayer, and tonight we will look at how to redeem the time. It's great if, if somebody could tell you um, what to do, but now we need to talk about how. So I encourage you to come back tonight. We'll be looking at how to redeem the time. But we're living in drop-dead time, friends. Our window of opportunity called life, this responsibility given to us, we don't know how long it is. We don't know how long it will last. We just know this, that we have to do what our responsibilities are while we have the opportunity to do it. Father, in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, Lord, we, we pray this morning as every head is bowed in your presence this morning. I pray, Lord God, that you would speak to our hearts, speak to each person here. Lord, I ask that this message was clear enough that, that we all understand, Father, what it means to live in drop-dead time, to know, Lord God, that there is a window. Our lives, oh God, are a mist, a vapor. They appear and they vanish. There's no guarantee, Lord, of the number of years we have. Somewhere in the midst of our lives, Lord, will come death, if not the rapture. And we have to be ready, Lord. There's no second chance. There's no plan B. Lord, I pray that every person that hears me is ready. They're right with you. Lord, they have confessed their sin. They've repented and turned from their sin, Lord. And they've acknowledged that you are Lord and Savior that only by the Spirit of God, by the blood of Christ, could they be made alive in you. I pray, Lord, that you will, you will speak clearly. Bring, Lord God, conviction to the hearts of those that, that are in need today. Lord, that every person will, will confess their sin and turn from it. Accept Jesus Christ, his, his life, his death, the blood that paid for our sin. Lord, please pray that you would draw them out, that they, that they would hear your voice calling them, and they'll know, Lord, today is the day. Today is the appointed time. Now is the time of salvation. I ask, Lord, as their heads are bowed, as, as we all just pray, that we're all sitting in your presence today, God. Lord, that you'll speak by your spirit. As our heads are bowed, is there someone here today, and you'll say, Pastor, please, I need Jesus. I, I, I know this. That when I don't do right, bad things happen. And I know I want to do right, but I know that I can't. I need Jesus in my life. I need the righteousness of Christ. I need the Spirit of God. I, I, I'm a sinner. I confess that. I know that. I repent of my sin. I turn from it. I don't want to live that life anymore. I want Jesus to come. I want him to establish his kingdom in my heart. I want to live for God. I want the righteousness of Christ. I want the peace that passes understanding. I want the joy of the Lord. So I'm asking that Jesus would forgive me. 
that will come and be Lord of my life. If that's you this morning, would you just lift up your hand? Nobody else is looking. I want to pray for you. Yes. This is for keeps, friends. This is for real. I, I'll just tell you this as your heads are still bowed. We just want to stay in the presence of the Lord. Remember a time when I was sitting in a church, a man of God was preaching. I wasn't listening too much to what he said. But at the altar call, I remember when he started to give the altar call and he said, if you were to stand before God tonight and give an account for your life, could you honestly say before God that you have done all that he has asked you to do? And I'll tell you, it gripped my heart. It changed my life, literally. When we come to realize that we will one day stand before God and we will give an account. And nothing that we have done of ourselves, it's all wood, hay, and stubble. Nothing will endure the fire of God's judgment. Only what we have done by the Spirit of God. Only what we have done for His kingdom. You need Jesus today. You need to to be forgiven for your sin, to, st to be able to stand before him. If, if it were to be today or tomorrow or next week or next year, we don't know. Are you right with God? Are you ready with God? Are you prepared to face him today? Are you willing to say, Lord, please forgive me of my sin. Wash me in your blood. I want to live for you. I've seen two hands. Is there somebody else? Yes. There's no. Three, four. There's somebody else. Say, I need Jesus. I understand drop dead time. I don't know the day or the hour. But I want to be ready. There's another hand you can take that. I want to do what God has asked me to do. I'm tired of doing it my own way. My own way is not working out. My plans are not working. I want God's plan for me. I want God's will for me. I give my life to Him. Is there somebody else? I'm giving my life to Christ. I'm giving my life to God that He might direct me. His will, not mine. Father, I thank you for those hands that were raised. You know the hearts, Lord. Father, only you know the sincerity of our hearts. When we raise our hand, when we close our eyes, when we pray here or when we're alone, when we lay our head on the pillow at night, only you know our hearts, Lord. Only you know our lives. Only you know our destiny. Only you know the time, the day and the hour. So I pray, Lord, that those who have raised their hands will be sincere in their commitment to you, their surrender to you. I pray, God, that their sins would be forgiven this very moment, that the Spirit of God will come in and change their hearts, change their lives. Make them, Lord, what you want them to be. Begin to direct their steps, cause them to hear your voice speaking to them. Lord, that they'll know the way that they're to take. God, make them, I pray, vessels of righteousness. Make them, Lord, pillars in the kingdom of God. Use them for your glory. God, this I ask in Jesus' name. For those who didn't respond, Lord, but know in their hearts that they should, Father, I pray before this day is over that they would turn to you and that they would confess their sin. They would acknowledge you as Lord and Savior. And I pray, God, in all of this that you would be glorified in us, that your kingdom would come, Lord, and that we will obey your will. Father, I pray today that you will draw people, those that, that need to come back tonight, Lord, to hear of how to redeem the time. I pray that, that you'll make a way for them to come. Lord, we just pray that in everything we say and do, our lives would be lived for your honor and glory. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.